Hello, welcome back to Rust 101. This is video 24. Um, uh, done the exercises for the last bit. Um, and we're getting on to um, topics that just are going to expand our knowledge of Rust, um, like flesh out bits that we haven't touched yet. So we've done, I, I would say we've done the kind of how do I write code and now this is like, what topics do I need to know about to be a, a well-rounded Rust programmer? Uh, and concurrency is really strong in Rust um, and parallelism. So that's where we're starting. Uh, I'm not Volker, but Volker wrote these bits of the slides, I guess. So that's what this is all about. Um, so what uh, what we've been talking about before is how to do stuff like um, just uh, figure out what dependencies we have in Rust and things like that. So um, using Cargo, which is the whole build tool and stuff like that, how to make nice APIs, how to test, how to benchmark, how to just do the kind of project setup. So now we're diving back into... Uh, uh, stuff that I at least find more interesting, which is like, how do you do stuff? And the stuff that we're going to do is um, uh, concurrency and parallelism. So first of all, we're going to talk about how to do stuff with Rayon. Uh, and that's all we're going to do this video, and then we'll get on to the other stuff later, except there's another, there's a little bit at the end. We'll see. All right, so just a little bit of motivation for why you might want to look at concurrency and parallelism. For a long time... Um, Computers just got faster without us doing anything. And then around about here, was that 2005? Um, it, we started only being able to get faster by having more things happening in parallel. That's what these black dots are. Um, okay, so that's your motivation. All right, so um, let's talk briefly about the difference between concurrency and parallelism because we're going to use both words. Um, both of them mean, mean doing um, having stuff happening in, in some sense at the same time. Uh, concurrency means um, getting on with some other work while we're waiting for something, that kind of thing, like responding to events like um, I made a web request. Uh, when it comes back, I need to do something, but for now I've got spare clock cycles, so I'll do something different instead, like maybe deal with some other piece of work that also needs to happen. Um, and parallelism means l actually doing two things at once. Um, so like supercomputers, like in this diagram, um, that are doing lots and lots of computation and it wouldn't be any use to just switch between, oh, do this computation, then do this computation and make it look like they're happening at the same time. You actually need them to happen at the same time. So that's why you need uh, two or more cores. Um, concurrency can happen on multiple cores or, you know, multiple things can actually genuinely be happening at the same time. But you could also, even on a single core um, machine, you could still be um, doing other work while you're waiting for a web request to come back or a file to open or all that kind of stuff. So um, in uh, modern Rust, if you're using the Tokyo uh, runtime for your async stuff, um, you'll be writing code that, that that looks like concurrent stuff, but it will actually be parallel if you have multiple uh, cores because Tokyo runs your stuff on multiple cores. But there are other runtimes that don't, so you know that could be a thing. All right, so let's look at a really nice library that a lot of people use for doing parallel stuff. So actually like calculating stuff on multiple CPUs at the same time uh, in a way that's really convenient. Uh, it's called Rayon. Um, uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to go through an algorithm. We're going to implement or do some of the implementation of an algorithm for searching text documents. We're going to make a parallel implementation, which is what this TF-IDF is. So TF is term frequency, and IDF is inverse document frequency. So um, TF is like, how often does a word occur? And IDF is, um, how common is that word across all the documents, or how rare? So we, we what we want to do is calculate, like process small parts of the document on lots of different CPU cores, and then aggregate the results together to get one answer. And that's the kind of the, the difficult part of um, parallelizing things. So here is an outline of uh, how we do that using Rayon. So, or rather, we, you know, it's not how we, this is an outline of how we do that. And by the way, we're using Rayon. Okay, so uh, let's have a look at how this works. So we have a function called document frequency. And we have this uh, list of documents, which is a slice of string slices, we want to return a hash map of, for each word, how common is it? So um, we're going to iterate through all the documents, and this para-iter is a rayon thing, means iterating in parallel, which we'll talk about in a second. And for every document, we want to 
run the term occurrence occurrence function on it, and then we want to somehow combine them together with the combine occurrences function. So yeah, para, para iter means um, act as if you're iterating through these. So like this code looks like just like we're iterating through, and we can call map on it. Um, but actually, um, using your threads that you've already spawned, or by spawning threads on different uh, CPUs, actually run this stuff in parallel. So for each document, it potentially could be running in parallel with each other document. And because of the, the niceness of the way Rust works, um, the, we can guarantee that we won't be stamping on each other's um, variables while we're doing this. So like Rust really starts paying off with this parallel stuff. You just say, run the term occurrence uh, thing on each of these documents. And Rust kind of has already made sure we're not going to be running, um, we're not going to be trampling on a, a, some kind of shared variable or shared state in some way. So it's beautiful. Um, and we're going to combine them together. So now we're, what we're not going to do is talk about exactly how we, we do the term occurrence and the combine occurrences. Um, we might get to some of that in the exercises. But yeah, basically the term occurrence function is got to just um, give back like a similar map to the, the final answer, but just for one document. So given a document, tell me how many times each word occurs inside that document, and then combine occurrences, and we can begin to see how reduce works now. Combine occurrences takes in two hash maps, and returns a hash map. So actually, it's pretty simple what it's doing. It's basically merging the two hash maps together. So if the same word appears in both, then we're going to add up the, the numbers, and if it doesn't, just include the ones that are in both in either map, right? So you just get like a combined together hash map. So the reduce function um, method is basically a way of in once that parallel iteration has, uh, well, or at least while we've well, at any point we have we may have two um, hash maps we can work with. Reduce will start doing the work of combining those two together, and eventually we'll combine them all together until. We've processed the output from all the documents, but it, even the in even the combination of stuff can happen in parallel, right? Because it just takes two and combines them together. Maybe some of the others are still processing. Um, so that's kind of cool. Um, by the way, notice that reduce needs to take a a default to say um, like a a, a a hash map to use uh, if you don't have anything like to use as like. The starting point. If you're combining, you, sometimes you might need to combine together a hash map that came from here with, um, you don't have anything to combine it with, so you need to combine it with this default. Or maybe there are no documents at all, in which case reduce is just going to return this default. So hash map, de hash map default just creates an empty hash map, right? So it's pretty straightforward to combine with something else. All right, so that's an outline of how you would write a parallel uh, algorithm using the Rayon library. And notice how we haven't done anything with any locks or anything. And actually, it's just Rust's own normal language rules that are making this stuff safe, uh, like fearless, fearlessly parallel. So it's pretty exciting. Um, OK, so uh, in order for this to work, uh, um, some stuff has to be true, right? So um, our combined documents function has to fit a certain pattern. So uh, in particular, you need to be able to combine, like, uh, B and C together, like two hash maps, and then later combine that with A. Uh, and that needs to be the same as if you combined A with B and then combined it with C, right? So that's the case for the algorithm we're going to write in that hash map, right? Because we're just adding things together. Also, you need to have, like I said, you need to have like a kind of zero value or like an empty value. So in this case, the empty hash map, hash map default gives us the empty value. Um, you don't need to worry too much about what this means, but basically combining it with X. Uh, gives you back x, right? So that's that's true of like combining a, an empty hash map with a, a hash map with some stuff in it. You just get back the thing that's the same as the the hash map with stuff in it that you started with. Um, yeah, and so given those rules, we can split, break up, like I was saying, and do one part here and then one part there, and then combine those two parts later. So that means it's parallelizable. Uh, and by the way, um, if these rules apply, it's called a, a monoid. And I've got some videos on. Um, maths, um, so you were part of the way towards a group, and it's really exciting, but you don't need to know any of that for this. Um, so go and check out, like, maths, the fun parts on my channel. Um, anyway, the, the whole point of this is, because uh, combined documents behaves nicely, we can, we can combine in parallel as well as counting words in parallel. 
All right, so we're nearly there on this video, uh, and then we'll go into more um, concurrency and parallelism next time. But just a little extra bit that we need to cover, which we've we've touched on before, but we need to make it a little bit clearer. Closures. So um, we've seen closures. They're these things with these pipe symbols. So we had one on the previous slide. Um, this is a closure saying um, every every time every document that you're processing. Uh, run this function, which takes in a document and counts the words in that document, returns the results. Right. So we need to talk, just make sure we're clear about closures. Closures are anonymous functions, um, but they have this magic property that they can use variables that are outside of their definition, which normal functions can't do. Normal functions can only use the stuff that's inside um, the variables that have been passed in as arguments. Um, so the um, yeah, for example, the the foo function. Can only, uh, can't, can't use any arguments because um, it wasn't passed in any arguments. But this closure here can use stuff in its scope. So this Z can get used inside this closure. Now we need to be just really careful about what's going on inside this function. So this is a function called foo and it returns something which implements something callable basically. Something callable with two arguments and returns um, one thing so you can call it so it returns a function that can that takes two arguments of i64s and returns an i64 so the last line of this function is the return value as normal with normal all functions but weirdly the last line of this function is itself a function right this it, their closure specifically um, so uh, this whole line is like just the return value of the function so the return value function is a closure that takes two arguments x and y, adds up x and y, and z. So it uses this, um, it captures this z value uh, and can use it as well. So now we've got a function bar which returns an i64, and what it does is it calls foo, and remember foo returns a closure. So it calls foo and puts the answer into a thing called f, so the, the type of f is something that implements fun. So this, this is a, a trait, right? The fun trait, um, which means it's, it can be called. It's a, it's a function-like thing. So f is, is a function-like thing, so we can call it. So we call it with two arguments. And then bar returns the result of calling f with those two arguments. So this is where the magic happens, right? So um, foo returned us at this closure. We called the closure with two arguments, so x, and x is 1, y is 2, and it gets to use z, uh, which is somewhere in, in the scope of, in its scope, in the scope of foo. Um, so the answer that bar returns is going to be 1 plus 2 plus 42, right? 45. Um, so even though in the body of the function, sorry, in the arguments of this function, there is no z, we can use the z from the environment so the return value of bar is 45 now if you've used something like javascript um, uh, or other languages that support closures this might all seem very obvious um, but it's in rust it's very very different from a normal function a normal function can't use something like foo couldn't use some variable from out here but closures can and that well, what it means is the closures are kind of this magical thing which when you create one and return it you don't just get like the definition of how to run this code you also get some variables tied up with it. And in some cases, those actually can be mutable variables as well, which is where things can get complicated. In this case, it's not mutable, so it's fine. Uh, there should be a let before this is said. Um, otherwise, this doesn't make sense. Uh, anyway, um, so we've seen the closures quite a bit already because um, when we're doing things with iterators, uh, for example, filtering them, we quite often use closures because it's just convenient instead of making a function somewhere else and passing it in. So here we're saying, given some iterator, we want to filter it with a function that takes in a variable, x, and um, checks whether it's even and returns true if it's even and false if it's odd. So what the filter function does is says, only keep the ones where this function returns true. So if we then collect them into a vector, because we've said a vec here and we said collect here, then we'll get a vector which has only got the even numbers inside this iterator. Notice in both of these closures, we're not saying the types of the arguments x and y or x here. Uh, you can, but you don't have to. Whereas in, in normal function definitions, you always have to say the types. In a closure, 
if the compiler can work it out from the context, it does. All right, so that was just a, like a, a recap on closures. Closures are unnamed inline functions that can capture stuff from their environment. And Rayon allows you to do parallel programming in Rust very conveniently, and you will often use closures like for that, like we did in our map. Um, uh, in our call to map, we passed in a closure to say, for everything in this um, list of stuff, run this bit of code. And that's what we're using the closure for. All right, next time more on parallelism. I uh, hope you enjoyed. Like and subscribe, etc. Cheers.